Two little mice fell in a bucket of cream. The first mouse quickly gave up and drowned. The second mouse wouldn't quit. He struggled so hard that eventually he turned that cream into butter and crawled out. Gentlemen, as of this moment, I am that second mouse. <laughs> Hello, listening people. Hello. Hello, Bartek. How are you doing? Good. Ryan, how are you? Yeah, I'm doing fairly well. It's been a pretty stock standard week since we've met up. It's just been one of those weeks where, uh, what, what have you got to report, Ryan? Nothing much. It kind of uh, matches up with the weather we had here in Melbourne, where it was just kind of a little bit of everything, but nothing to the extreme. No joke, we we had apparently a stinking hot day here yesterday, according to all of the weathers. It was like 36 degrees Celsius, because we're Australian, mm-hmm. and that's important. And we're Polish. Uh, what do they use in Poland? Do they use I'm Fahrenheit pretty, or Celsius? Sh- pretty sure it's Celsius. Okay. but uh, And it was like, it's 36, and I'm like, where where's this heat? I was looking around being like, where's this heat? It's actually quite chilly. So I was, I was weirded out by that. But no, overall, it's just things are going well. Things are going uh, pretty pretty smoothly to the point in which yesterday it was just such a cruisy day I decided I'm going to watch the podcast movie at 3 o'clock in the afternoon that's Whoa. the type of movie usually I watch, it at, I watch them at the night at night time but this is this was just one of those ones where I, I've seen this movie quite a few times it's a bit of a long one as well and I was like you know what I'm just going to watch it and then uh, after I'm done get ready to make some dinner so that's how things are here. Man, it's uh, like me when we started the podcast, watching the afternoon. Whoa. <laughs> but uh, we're spitting Polish, likingly, because we're always spitting, and we both happen to be of Polish descent, as you can tell by our first names, Ryan and Bartek, the most Polish names. And that's why we're in the top 10 Polish I'm podcasts. I'm pushing it a little bit. But yeah, yeah, yours is fairly, uh, you know, Anglo-Saxon, dare I say. But well, I uh, don't play saxophone, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you got me. It's like the most low effort joke I've ever made, but I'm glad it made you laugh. <laughs> when you said it, you said it so casually. That's the thing. Usually, with your low effort jokes, you you lean into like I'm telling a joke, but you said it just so <laughs> offhand. But uh, we're talking about movies that come recommended. The cycle of recommendation goes, Bartek recommends a film, then we talk about it. Then I recommend a film, then we talk about it. And you, the listening people out there, can suggest a movie to us, and we'll put put it on the list and draw it out of a hat and put it on the podcast to discuss. And this one, uh, I'm reading the description, even though I'm in the episode, and it's Bartek. You did this. Mm, I'll be writing that description tomorrow, so you sing into the future. Mm, so uh, remind us all what we are looking at today. So I've recommended for us the 2002 film Catch Me If You Can. Directed by Steven Spielberg. Spielberg Stevens. It's a DreamWorks movie. Mm-hmm. Like I Shrek. For- I forgot about that. I forgot it was, and I wondered why it's a DreamWorks movie. Like, is he usually working? Like, I guess Spielberg does have, like, a part of investment in DreamWorks, does he? Or was he part of Pixar? I know he, he's got his fingers in so many different pies I don't of know animation. About Pix- Pixar was he, Steve Jobs, wasn't it? Oh, yes. Wrong St- Steve. Steve. He was with... Spielberg was with Warner Brothers in some way because he did Animaniacs and, and Pinky and the Brain and things of that nature. Uh, yeah, it's good. I know at the end of the film they've got like that logo that's like the E.T. silhouette on the mm, bike. Amblin production, Amblin, that's yeah. his usual one. Uh, but I was just funny. I, I, I was wondering why DreamWorks, and I, and I joked to my wife Rachel, is it because it's got an animated opening credits hmm. sequence. You, you know, this is 2002, the same year as Goldmember, where he showed up at the beginning, which had Mike Myers, who Mike Myers was the main character of the big DreamWorks film, Shrek. Wow. It's all connected. Mm-hmm. But Catch Me If You Can from 2002, if people, you have not seen the movie before, we recommend that you give it a watch. It is a uh, inspired by true events uh, tale about one of the most ambitious, successful 
crazy con men in American history of that time, at least. Uh, Frank Frank Abagnale Jr. Mm-hmm. and uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. It's a, look. Here's the thing. It's a movie where Leonardo DiCaprio gets to run around playing this character who wears all of these different little outfits, and he's quippy and fun, and he's trying to outrun and and outsmart Tom Hanks. That's the movie. Go watch it. Now you can hear us talk about it. Uh, you recommended this, recommended this. so uh, tell us a bit more about why you did that and your overall uh, history with this. Uh, so I'd seen this film once before, forever ago, on TV, um, and I remember really enjoying it, uh, but I didn't remember... Well, it's a bit of a funny story. I didn't remember too much about it, Um well, I found out as I was watching the film that in my head, I had an idea of two films uh, where one of them was the story of like, oh, uh, uh, Leonardo da, da, Vin- da Vinci, DiCaprio being chased by Tom Hanks. Um, and then there was the other film of like, oh, the, the based on the real life con man thing. And for some reason in my head growing up, I just recalled that like oh yeah those were like two separate films that i watched so as i was watching this like oh it was all just the one film Mm. um so i was actually pleasantly surprised by that because i wanted to track down what that other film was but no it was the same film all along um but yeah with that in mind like i only really remembered uh that yeah there, there was like a chase going on i remember the opening credits was you know very memorable it's been spoofed and done in a lot. Simpsons actually had a really great homage I th- to I it. Think, I think I actually saw that Simpsons episode first because it was like mm-hmm. Bart and Lisa were chasing their parents, right? Mm-hmm, as they were going I, I think around that, the world. I think that might have actually been a factor in me, like thinking it was two different mm. films because in my head I was also thinking like, oh yeah, isn't it like Leonardo DiCaprio and some girl that he's with are being chased by mm-hmm. Tom Hanks? But no, that was not the case at all. He wanted it to be, but it didn't work out. Amy Adams betrayed him. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, that, that could have been the case, but it was not. It was not Amy Adams, you dirty, dirty rat. Um, the music is also very memorable and iconic. Mm. Just that, that I was saying to my wife Rachel, the film would be forty percent less good if it wasn't <laughs> for the score. The score that that opening credits the music, it really is a character in itself. It tells you so much. I, I remember we talked about this. We've talked about this a few times, like City Slickers and Pink Panther, The uh, having a great opening credit mm. sequence, not just because it's animated, but because you have a certain musical motif that complements what you're about to watch and informs you of what you're getting into is is a, honestly a missing art form in cinema at the moment. I, I really am bummed by that, just like how in TV... Uh, TV being serialized now, we've we've moved away, not wholeheartedly, but majorly from a good cold open sting. Mm. Uh, I miss that so much. And uh, when I was watching Catch Me If You Can yesterday afternoon, I was just sitting back going, ah, oh, man, I miss these type of credits. Yeah, I, I'm not one for musical analysis. It's something I haven't done too much of. But for this one, I can actually kind of see it representing the film because, you know, you got these like quiet, like, Mm-hmm. and you got the slight louder ones that, and I see that as like the quiet ones uh, you know Leonardo DiCaprio the mouse that's like sneaking mm-hmm. around it's quiet it's a bit subdued and then the louder one is like oh it's Tom Hanks out Stomping in the open in, yeah. searching around for him so it's like mm-hmm. I'm sneaking around I'm searching for you and there's even a moment where the music swings into different styles because it is in the opening credits telling you about these different eras of Frank's life, like this real swing music and party atmosphere, and that will come later in the movie when he is at the, the party for him and Amy Adams. It's it's all there, but uh, you, you had a foggy memory of this. You had merged a few things together. You'd seen it on TV at some point. Mm. I don't even recollect if it wasn't for me saying at the end of the last episode it was a Spielberg. Would you have even remembered that i think when i what before i recommended the film i obviously had to look up like the year and i think i saw that with little steven spielberg I'm like oh yeah this is this is really you know high mm. uh esteem high highly prolific you know we've got tom hanks we've got leonardo dicaprio we've got steven spielberg like there's a three pretty big names yeah john williams doing the music everything mm-hmm. yeah. so but it was it's interesting because yeah it was like 
in my head, like the one film that's like, oh, there's like airport and like the chase mm. going on. And then there was that other film I saw where, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio walks into the classroom and like mm. very sternly writes his name and is being the teacher. I'm like, oh yeah, what was that other film? I'm going to recommend that at some point, but <laughs> no, I already did. Uh, so I grew up with this. This was always on television. It was always on and it's just a, a rip roaringly entertaining movie. It's a crowd pleaser. It's a fun concept. Uh, all of the different schemes and ways that this character is grifting people and getting money. And uh, it's just ev- highly engaging and entertaining. It's something that it's like they do a good job of making it cinematic. At no point am I thinking while watching this, oh, I'd rather watch the documentary version of this story. Yes, that would be interesting in its own right, but the filmmaking has always been electric to me. It's one of my favorite Spielberg movies. It just goes down so fast and smooth. This is over I think last two week you hours. said it was your favorite. Yeah, I mean, it's always hard. I mean, he has so many yeah. great films. I know nowadays it's kind of agreed upon to kind of shit on Spielberg because, you know, Spielbergian sentimentality and he kind of does shit movies a lot nowadays. He Ready Player Netflix. One. And, he, <laughs> and um, you know, he did a movie all about his own childhood recently and it's like that's the ultimate Spielbergian cliche. But uh, because, you know, him and his childhood and his parents, it's all in his work. But uh, I think about Leonardo DiCaprio for this role in particular a lot. Uh, everyone has their role they think of him for but this is the one that i gravitate towards the most it's him at the height of his power he's young he's sexy he's fun um and i love tom hanks in this as well it's one of my go-to tom hanks performances outside of woody from toy story i think that's always going to be my favorite tom hanks performance but uh this is definitely in my top five of his i i just i have a i just when it starts, this has the, the castaway start where it's Tom Hanks as some nebbish dude who's who's being obstructed from doing something and he's just being like administrative guy. He's like, no, you need to let me through here, you see. And it just, in this it's raining and it's like, oh, all he needs is a cold and he will be in Castaway again. And it also is similar to Bridge of Spies in that way too. And uh, I just like Tom Hanks a lot. He's very, I mean, he's a great actor for a reason, but he's really great at playing this type of role where you want him to catch Leonardo DiCaprio, but you also, um, ju- you're just admiring about uh, at how much of just an average guy he is. Like Tom Hanks isn't a super genius, like, FB, you know, he isn't a super genius cop man. He's just a guy yeah. who is observant. It's like, like two years ago, I watched a lot of Lupin the Third, mm-hmm. um, and there was a little bit uh, of that whole like you know criminal and cop dynamic going on here. But like the cop in this case wasn't like super over the top or anything like that. Um, so it was interesting seeing like a bit more of a subdued version of that. He wasn't. Uh, is it L from L from Death Note? Death Note. He's not that. He's not crazy, super genius quirks. He's just a guy that is lonely. No, I think, to, uh, now that you mentioned, I think Tom Hanks should have been squatting on some chairs for most of the film. <laughs> and eating little candies <laughs> while, or whatever. While, while the villain was working a few, like, desks down. Oh, man. That would have been, that actually would have made the movie better. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Tom Hanks is L. Do it, guys. So, now that you got to watch the movie again... You know, you're here, you're, you're, you're fully aware now. Yes, catch me if you can. I'm watching it. You're not watching it on TV with ads and stuff. And I, when did you see it on TV? Do you recollect how long ago was it? Was it when you were in high school? That's a really good university, question. University, even back further because this I would, is 2002. I would estimate somewhere in high school, but I could not pinpoint the year. So, so tell us a bit about your experience watching it now. I mean, it's like you said, yeah, it's a crowd-pleasing film. It was really fun. The performances were great. Um, the music was great. Uh, when I turned it on, I did see that it was over two hours long. I'm like, oh, wow, this is longer than I expected. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the time flew by. It was just a really fun film. What were one of what were some of those elements that just popped for you? Because you 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 realized while you're watching it, oh, these are the two films, but they're in the one. Mm. But outside of that, what were the things that you were just gravitating towards? Um, I guess 
Because I, I did remember, you know, snippets of the film. Like, I remembered the, the classroom scene with the chalk. I remembered Tom Hanks's joke. That was always one that I just thought to myself about. Like, oh, yeah, I love Tom Hanks. There was that one, Catch Me If You Can, where he did the Go Fuck Yourself. Um, yeah, hearing Tom Hanks swear is, it, it, it is a lot, isn't it? Because he's just <laughs> such a wholesome guy that it's like, yeah, he swears in his career, but it, it's a lot. He tries to repeat it at one point, but it cuts away. Um, Perfectly. Uh, yeah, and I also remembered the the scene in France where he's like actually being put in the car, where you get the mm. cameo from the real guy. Mm. Um, also, yeah, just I always remembered the main character's name, the Frank Abagnale. It like, has a ring to it. So when I was watching the film, it's like, oh, this is the Frank Abagnale film. They also help beat it into your head by having characters mispronounce it and then other characters correctly pronounce it for mm. them. And well, I think the first time that happens is like in the classroom scene where he like mm. brings up the alternatives mm-hmm. and then it like gets a call back when like the cop was talking to his mom and it was like, mm-hmm. Abignali? Mm-hmm. It's Abignale actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, uh, for this particular watch, my biggest joy factor was Christopher Walken. Mm, I, I didn't remember him, so that was a great part. Yes, I brought him up at the end of the last episode, and you were like, oh, he's in that? And I'm like, oh, man. I remembered you said that, because uh, we had a conversation uh, about him and, afterwards. And then yeah. I was like, oh, man, does he have a speech and a half in this movie? That I, Look, Christopher Walken... He's a very versatile. He has a he is a he is a versatile actor. Old jokes aside, uh, mm. he's very he's a great actor, and I just love I love him in this movie. He, it's also one of my he got nominated for it, right? It's one of my go tos for him as well. I grew up with this uh, movie, like I said. So Christopher Walken in this and Mouse Hunt and a handful of other things was just there, and he does all of the walk-in things you like. He dances, he's smiling, he's telling jokes. It's it's a truly just energetic thing to behold, and uh, it does upset me that he is that caliber of actor that has reached a certain age now where Hollywood and the film system doesn't know what to do with him, him and Robert De Niro, Al Pacino, some of these really great actors, they reach a certain period in their life where they have to do these fucking embarrassing roles that aren't using their talents at all. And here in Catch Me If You Can, I I don't know if you'll agree with this, but isn't this like the perfect use of what Christopher Walken does as a performer. Like, all of that energy and that weird mannerisms that he has and speaking and this dancing and just all of it, to me, is just pitch perfect in Catch Me If You Can. I'm just like, this is a Christopher Walken role right here. It's really strong. It feels very comfortable to put him into the role. Like, you get... It doesn't feel like an exaggeration of what he can do. It, it feels very natural. Like you said, it's got the dancing, which, yeah, just when you said it, to put in my head, like, yeah, he's he's known for, like, the funny dancing stuff. Um, like, you even have a scene where he's being dramatic and he, like, breaks down into tears and you read in the trivia, like, oh, yeah, that, he just did that in one take and that's what they used it. That's They just used it. Mm. Um, and, yeah, the, the film always just keeps coming back to him. Like, the, the our main character is always on the run, always finds time to meet his father, and there's always this interesting sort of dynamic going on between them. Mm. Um, and even for, yeah, the Leonardo DiCaprio character, for the Abignale character, um, he, he's always putting on this persona of of confidence and like charm and all that, but around his father, he's like he always just goes back to being a kid, even though he's like I'm a doctor now, I'm a Dad, lawyer, I have Daddy. a Corvette. So. Yeah, and both of them are kidding themselves. It's more obvious with Christopher Walken. The more we meet him as time progresses, the worse he is, and the more deluded he is, and just he's isolated himself so greatly. Uh, But he's stuck, and eventually he dies, a really mundane death that happened because of all of these circumstances that we see being built up in the movie. And Christopher Walken does, I mean, masterclass work when it comes to showing that that bright light in those eyes dimming as the movie goes on, but he's still playing up to his son that everything's okay. But look at how, how like wide eyed and, and truly 
truly charismatic he is in that scene where he's like, hey, miss, uh, you drop this, huh? And then when you see him in the final scene in the movie, he's just, he's, he's a demoralized character, but Walken just, he does it so well where you, you can see how he's ch- this character has changed over the years, but he's still trying to pretend to be this big thing for his son. Yeah, you mentioned like the, the light dimming, so like it's going down throughout the film. Mm. But it is kind of like this roller coaster where it goes like up and down and like the heights and the lows are just lower each time because, mm. yeah, he is, you know, kind of he's deluded and all that. But when he's talking to his son, I feel like there's these moments where like he's just quiet and listening and nodding and he knows in his head that like yeah, there, there's a there's a repression or at least a sort of delusion going on here. But he because the conversation goes on and he has to keep going on. He kind of seems like he's avoiding the realization, mm, but he knows it, what Frank's it's, or at least pretending that he's avoiding it. Yeah, and he, I mean, and he knows what Frank's doing. I yeah. love that. I <laughs> mean, you can't the, stop. <laughs> the thing too is, Walken has to not only make us believe that he's this character's father, but he also, through the writing as well, this character is very important in terms of letting us see how. Uh, uh, Frank Abagnale Jr. is the man he is. And so you have all of these little moments of Christopher Walken doing the huckster routine himself. And uh, you see how uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, the actor, tries to emulate what Christopher Walken's doing in that performance throughout the movie. It's you just, get so many times where he's doing the necklace thing, yeah. He's doing all the dancing and, and things of that nature. It, 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 I mean, Walken is, is magnificent and... That speech he gives, you know, there's two mice. And I I always think of that speech when I think of Walken. It's definitely in my brain. And mm. and it's just the way he says it and how it keeps coming up as this idea in the movie. It's a great thing to pin onto not only Walken's character, but Leo's character as well. This, this begrudging determination to just keep going and that we'll eventually crawl our way out. I really like the... um. Yeah, you know, that whole first like little attempt of a heist that Walken puts him through, mm-hmm. where it's like the you know we'll get the suit, then you be the chauffeur, then you do this, and then you you'll see me walking out of the, being <laughs> show uh, not showing the door. They'll open the door for me, mm-hmm. biggest guy in the bank, and like you see all these steps, and it's like oh yes, 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 and there's going to be the big payoff, and then it's just this sad and blunt sort of like no, so we can't do that. And then Leo goes through a similar thing when he's trying to get all of his huckster stuff going on and they're Mm. saying the same thing to him. Yeah, but then you also get the twist on that where, like, recurring figures from that time, like, meet him again when he's better at it. And it's like, oh, now he succeeded. Like, there was, I remember... Mm. I think it was the first time he tried to do the necklace thing. It's like, yeah. oh, and then what you turn it's to a guy. He, yeah. he goes down, picks it up, turns back, and it's like the manager. And then later <laughs> on, that manager's like, very nice to meet you. Thank you very much for picking the bank. And it's like, mm. oh, he's moved up. He's surpassed his father already. Yeah, just it does bum me out that, that people in, in Hollywood, they reach a certain age and they just don't like people don't know how to use them they, and their talents they like, appear as themselves in adam sandler films christopher walken is at that stage where people just kind of use him as a as a joke in itself because he he has a very eccentric way of performing but if you're a skilled writer and director and you cast him in a role it can really elevate your material and here is he's a great example of that where yeah, yeah, he just he just elevates this movie so so strongly, and so I you know it's just great to flag him up because when we've had one of the podcasts, we've looked at his more uh, low low effort material father figures, where it's like he was the weakest one of the fathers that we met. He was the the dentist father at the very end that he went to go meet. Uh, he and- he was the one that ended up being there. Father, right? Uh, well, he was the wife's new. Lover. Yeah, probably. And then, obviously, Nine Lives. Well, Nine Lives was the one I was thinking. Where of, he's yeah. he's absolutely crazy, but it's such a weird thing. And it's like, why is he here? But because uh, it's Christopher Walken. Now, Leonardo DiCaprio has to carry this movie on his shoulders as well. He has a large place of responsibility. And uh, are you a Leo fan? How are you when it comes to Leo? Because this is the first time we've had him on the pod. Mm. And so I just want to touch base with you when it comes to DiCaprio. He's one of the most acclaimed and uh, busy actors working today. But uh, what are your thoughts on him? 
he's always got a screen presence that draws me in. He's always fun to watch. Um, his character's always entertaining. He always, he's he's just great. Yeah, I think he always brings an element of entertainment, and the key word is is fun. Even in his more dramatic roles, such as say Blood Diamond or Shutter Island or things like that. He still has that level of uh, he's a performer that knows that we're here to have a good time, Mm. to be entertained. He's not like, say, your your Tom Hardy or your Michael Fassbender, who are also fantastic actors, where they're about, like, uh, brooding. and uh, uh. Leo has those brooding things, too, not to say otherwise. Like, I mean, look what he went through with The Revenant. But even then, he's always got this certain sparkle to him where he's just, he is someone when you watch them, I, I clap my hands together and go, oh, yeah. Like with Django Unchained, he he's unabashedly playing a cartoon. Mm. Uh, and... <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a sight he's to really behold. leads into it, yeah. Wolf of Wall Street, same thing where he's he's just so physical. That whole entire sequence in Wolf of Wall Street where the drugs he's kick dr- in and he's just I was literally about to bring that up, but you beat me to it. I mean, what else would I bring up from Wolf of Wall Street I remember when ba- it comes to him? I remember that's a yeah. great scene. I remember back in the day there was a review I watched of that film where they talked about how that scene where he's trying to get in the car while he's like numbed and drugged up is like one of the best bits of physical comedy acting that's been in cinema. I think that was Midnight Screenings. He throws himself into these roles. That's He really throws himself in. He gives it a wholehearted attempt. Now, he's not my favourite actor in the world, and I do think that he was burdened with uh, the weird Hollywood media cycle because he was a pretty blonde-haired boy, mm. and... You know, people don't discuss this enough, but he was a child actor that was also sexualized in a weird way, like many child actors were, especially then, like your your Britney Spears or whatever, like your child performers. He also was, but it's like, ah, but he's Leo. And he had the, um, what was it, the, the pussy posse and all of that. So it's like, it's very strange. Uh, but he is so good here because I think he's also really good at playing slime bolts that mm. you can't help but go, no, you. That's him in Titanic. I guess bring up before, like, oh, yeah, I remember his the, his character's name. This the Frank Abagnale. Just when he's playing the real-life people, like, you remember the names Frank Abagnale. You remember the names Jordan Belford, and you think of Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> yeah, with different color hair. Um, <laughs> it was so wild to me. They kept saying, he's got brown hair. And I'm like, does he in this? They kept saying, oh, yes, this brown-haired boy. I'm like, is he? He looks blonde to me. Maybe I'm just... They also keep saying he's 16. <laughs> yeah, I mean, how old was he here? He was 27, like... apparently. Oof, yeah, I mean, he's... Younger he's, than us. <laughs> he's, he's fresh-faced, for sure. I was like, oh, maybe 22. I could believe 22. But yeah, 16 is... It's always amusing when... Um, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but there are these pictures that people put up of uh, the actors of the Hunger Games when they were actually the ages of their characters. So mm-hmm. like Jennifer Lawrence and Josh, Josh Hutchinson and all of that. And it's like, you know, they look like actual teenagers. Like how fucked up would the Hunger Games be if they actually cast like actual, actual children? And it's like, yeah, Hollywood doesn't necessarily do that. How young are the characters in the film meant to be? Like 14, 15. Oh, so like low teens. Yeah, 15, or early teens, 16, right? you know, your usual 14 to 16 type deal. Yeah. Uh, you know, the target demographic for the books. The, the middle school. Yes. Uh, but same here where it's like, I do wonder what this would look like if we had an actor that actually was a, a, a teenager and we saw them smooth talk their way through things. Like because they made it with Tom Holland or something. Yeah, because, I, I mean, Leo's great in this, but there's a level of detachment I have of just, because there's this thing where they start the movie and they say, he did all of these things. Isn't that crazy that this guy did all these things before he's 19? 19, and you're like, that is crazy. I'm going to watch a movie that convinces me that that's real. And there's an element, because he's clearly not a teenage boy, that I I detach myself from that, like, uh, sus- like that, that, like, questioning of like how like how did a guy like this do this where i just go nah yeah he you know handsome 20 something guy could do this sure <laughs> i'm like <laughs> you're a teacher yep 
could you imagine one of your kids being able to do that? Like, yeah, it's like someone my sister's age, yeah. <laughs> right? That's crazy. Oh, I have, I have a teacher question for you. When he took over the classroom, mm. thoughts on that? Walk us through. <laughs> I remember when I was watching- Because um, you're a substitute teacher. Yes. I remember watching that and I was just thinking to myself, Steven Spielberg, come down here. I'll, let's, I'll show you what the job's really like. Because <laughs> the, the way he got their attention, it was like, oh, I wish I could do that really quickly. Yes. Well, they thought he was a fellow student, and then he yelled at them. Mm. Uh, what about the other substitute teacher? What did you think of her? <laughs> oh, that poor lady. That have, was that was fun. Have you been that lady? Um, I had to travel all this way, and they got a, they already had another person. No, I've had the th- I've had a thing where it actually happened just a month or so ago where. I've gone to schools that have like multiple campuses and the campuses are like in different suburbs, like adjacent to each other. Um, and I went to the wrong one because that's where I was told to go. It's like, oh no, they actually need you at the other one. So you need to go over there quickly. Oh, okay. Mm. Have to hurry. Uh, yeah, but Leo, Leo's particularly great. What were some of those moments of his performance or certain things that he had to pull off as an actor that, that you were looking at when it came to catch me if you can on this watch? Sorry, could you ask that again? So, like, with Leo, we, we we talked about we like him, he's fun, he's entertaining. We can pull a, these iconic moments that we like from, say, Django or from Wolf of Wall Street. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to, to this particular movie, what are your go-to moments when it comes to what he was doing as an actor? Right. Um. So I would point to the ones where he manipulates a conversation um by, I guess, taking into the context of what's happening in the scene. So one example is when the first scene where he, uh, well, it, it, chronologically the first scene where he and Tom Hanks meet in that mm-hmm. hotel room, where he plays it off really cool, um, you know, plays off the fact that, uh, you know, this guy doesn't know what he's meant to look like. He plays it off like he's a secret service, but it actually all goes back to the the speech that his dad gave about mm-hmm. like, why do the Yankees always win? Because everyone's staring at the pinstripes. Yeah. Another great moment. Yeah. Of everyone story. is always staring at, you know, the, the charm, the surface level, and he gets to manipulate it there. He gets to make these like risky moves. Like, yeah, have my whole wallet, mm-hmm. which later on you find out that like, if you'd open that wallet and look through it, it's clearly like a kid's wallet. You know, the, the, there is absolutely nothing in there. He's that got would... labels of things that he tears off, which yeah. is established also in the speech and, and scene. Tom, yeah, and Tom Hanks even asks him later on, like, "Why did you give me your wallet? Why? Why wouldn't you think I'd look?" And he gave him the line: "The you know, you're always looking at the pinstripes." So and Tom Hanks rejects that at first. He's like, "No, <laughs> it's because I have Mickey Mantle." Sure. <laughs> I said that when I was younger, like <laughs> a few weeks younger. <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess in that sense it goes back to the writing of like his acting, his performance and the script itself kind of go back to the whole philosophy that the film gives you about like, you're always looking at the pinstripes and the fact that Leo em- embraces and uh, is a symbol of that uh, is the core to his performance. And mm. yeah, he really nails it. I was particularly drawn to the era where he became a doctor Mm. And when he got cold to look at an incident <laughs> and it freaked him out seeing this kid's exposed bone in his leg and all of that. And also, I feel like uh, we Leonardo has a certain type of physicality he uses when he does comedic beats. And when he was holding the, the what was it, like little forceps or tongs and he had the, the cotton wad on it and he was pressing against his mouth and just umming and ahhing. It brought so many images of him doing similar-esque things in other performances, but this was really the flashpoint for me. Like, this is where it started for me to notice that with him. Mm. Because, like I said, uh, uh, this and uh, Titanic uh, were the films that I grew up with him in. Those were the pivotal ones that were always on TV. And and, and I had Critters 3, where he was the lead character in that as well, where he's a child, child. But... um. Yeah, I don't think of Leo for that necessarily. People forget Leo. Leo was a child actor, but because uh, he's just been around for so long. But yeah, I, I I really liked the era where he was a doctor and he was wooing Amy Adams. The whole conversation mm. about her braces and I love that smile you have. And she's got this big smile. Uh, seeing him just court this person and then actually fall in love with them. Uh, at first, it was the most 
minor, inconsequential, just con job on her, but then it became something more, something serious. And uh, when my favorite line in the movie is when he's explaining himself to her and he's like, I'm not a Lutheran. And then she's like, you're not a Lutheran. It's like the one thing she questioned after the big explanation. Yeah, <laughs> that, was, that was a great thing. And yes, that whole scene where he's telling her, meet me here, and the, the, the curtain's blowing in the face. And that's, a, that's a, just a striking moment. And I think Leo really pulls it off there. Just truly, truly great. And you mentioned it before, but uh, an image that stayed with you and an image that stayed with me, and I think it's just great shot composition, but Leo's face is when he does finally get captured by the police. He's out front of the window there, and he's like, no, please take me to the car straight away. I don't want them to see that, you know, because he's looking into this, you know, his mother's place. And- oh, oh, I, no, I was talking about the one in France, but yeah, that was a good one too. No, that was a good one. Oh, yes, yes, the one in France. Yes, yes, sorry, sorry. I got muddled up. But um, yeah, when he did that, uh, it's... Yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a very well crafted film. Now, what were some points you want to touch upon when it when it when it comes to this particular film? When it comes to Catch Me If You Can, what were some things that you noted down during your watch that you're like, oh, I want to talk about this? Um, a lot of the earlier stuff with the Tom Hanks character, where he's still chasing him down, and you've got like the the phone calls with him every Christmas. I can't remember if you said it on recording or just before we were recording, but like that felt very kind of Spielbergian, like scripted kind of thing. Yes, that's your Spielbergian magic. Yeah, we had there was that one line where I think it was the first or second time he got the call, um, and Tom Hanks latched onto the fact like you're calling me because you don't have anyone else to call, and he started laughing about that. Mm-hmm. And that that felt a bit like, oh, I don't really buy that. Yeah, there's some Spielberg schmaltz in mm. this, for, for, for sure. It's, it's like the, got the, that. Tom Hanks' character is a fun character, but he's not really, I don't really buy him as being like that. Maybe later on when they're kind of working together, and it's like, you can run away, no one's stopping you, see? I don't mean this jokingly, but it is something... Um, he reminded me of Rick Moranis in My Blue Heaven. Yeah. Tom Hanks of just this anal retentive guy who's a pen pusher in the biz mm. that he in the in the place he works out of law enforcement. Nobody respects him. His wife has left him. He's yeah. got nothing. <laughs> and now his best friend is a criminal that he has to handle. A yeah, bit of a, a bit a bit of a different character from the Rick Moranis one, but also a little bit of Robert Duvall in uh, Falling, Falling Down. Down yes, yes, where he is trying to be the serious one. It's like, hey guys, look, you can keep making these jokes about like you know I'm going to retire and like oh this criminal couldn't be doing this, but guys, I have evidence right here that this thing is going to happen. It's like ah oh, okay, sure, whatever. What's really magnificent about Tom Hanks's role is his job, like that specific division has no credibility from everyone. They all acknowledge you've worked really hard. You've written the book on how to do this, but who cares? Like who cares, honestly? And that's why Leo can keep getting away with it so long because they they don't treat it seriously. But as the years go by, as the humiliations keep stacking up, they care now. There's that moment where it's like, ah, Tom, you know, they're like, no, you're not going to get him because uh, you let him go. But that doesn't stop the story from happening. And that doesn't stop the the police from closing the noose around uh, Leo's neck as it goes on. Because that was the thing I, I, I also really like about a period piece. Uh, a period piece crime thing is there is a level of investigation styles are different to how they are now. There was a wonderful series called Life on Mars back in the day. I don't know if you were at all familiar with it, but it was a British crime show where a modern day police officer, like a modern day crime forensics guy, got hit by a car or something rather, and he travels back in time to the 70s. And he's now in like 70s Britain and he's a cop and he's having to solve crimes and he's having and he's doing it the modern way. Mm -hmm. And you have all of these corrupt 
asshole British inspectors and whatnot being befuddled by this and not treating him seriously. And like a large part of the story in Life on Mars is not actually the cases being solved, but rather the hurdles of uh, trying to solve them with your modern standards when in the past they don't use those at yeah, all. Yeah, I've, I've seen things that done have done things like that, yeah. There's been many things like that, or like, oh no, you can't do that, we need fingerprints, or this, 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 you're contaminating a crime scene like this, you're, you're doing it like that, and... I, I just really, uh, I thought that was really great. I just recently watched uh, the Korean film um, Memories Memories of a Murder, and it's all about, like, Korean police corruption. There's just, like, a scene where it's, like, the, 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 in the mud they've got the shoe print for the killer. Like, okay, great, that's awesome. Uh, we should probably tape this up and blah. And then he walks off, and then he comes back to deal with it, and a big tractor, like a farmer, is just driving by, just drives over it, and he's like, no! <laughs> and all that. <laughs> so then later on, he just grabs a person who thinks he thinks is the like killer, he just grabs their shoe off of their foot and walks like drives back over to this field and just sticks it in the mud and then takes a photo of it. And he's like, there you go, it works now. It's like, there's different angles, but I, I do get a real thrill out of, you know, stories told in the past, whether it is in the 20th century or even beyond. I think that's a little bit of a thrill when you watch, like I say, say a, a Jack the Ripper story, where it's like, look at these investigators trying to figure it out back in the day and they didn't figure it out. Or even when you watch something like Zodiac, for instance, or stories about the Zodiac killer, these criminals that got away, but maybe they wouldn't have if they had the ability of modern day forensics to mm. nail them down there's a yeah there's a though a lot of that was going through my mind like i obviously they didn't have as many like you know machines that could automatically like scan the devices mm. to find the imperfections and like that and when i was reading up something i think it was like the actual jordan belford's like wikipedia page or maybe it was the wikipedia page on this film a big part of the discussion that was happening around the film and his whole story is like, oh, the parts that were fabricated, the parts that were exaggerated, like mm. some, uh, there's a chance that a lot of it was made up um, and this information has come about thanks to like modern day technology that wasn't available at the time. Oh, yeah, for Frank Ab Abagnale? Yeah, 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 yeah. And so when I read that, I was like, yeah, I was having those thoughts throughout the film, but, you know, that's the beauty of this being you know, real life stories said in the past before we had all that. And when you get these uh, con job stories, there's always just a, a an amusement to the lengths they'll go to to do it, such as him having a bathtub filled with all of these little model airplanes. Yes. The first time he did that, it was like, oh, okay, that's clever. And then you see a billion, it's like, ah, oh, it really worked, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, re it really worked. Huh? Or the uh, real laugh out loud moment of, has anyone ever told you you have the most beautiful eyes that anyone's ever seen? And she's like, I, well, actually, yes, I get that a lot. It's like, <laughs> he tried to to use the old flirtation and she it worked but she's like this happens a lot actually mm. this isn't unusual but no I, I i get a kick out of true stories and you know fictional stories of uh people doing schemes and, and and doing con jobs and just seeing how you get away with it and the person chasing them did we ever watch i can't remember if you watched but i i'm a big fan of that documentary art and craft i can't remember if you, i got you to watch it but you, it's basically i remember you telling me about it a few months ago but i don't think i ever got around art to and it. craft is a truly great film uh documentary where it's just about this one guy who will not stop forging like artworks and like US history ones and there's just this other art guy who knows that he's doing this he's not like a law enforcement he's just another art expert and he's pissed off and it's almost a story of two absolutely annoying people who <laughs> are bitter enemies without ever actually having to meet all that much and the police in the middle being confused by this entire thing because it's at still even to this day this level of like that's so obscure. Who cares? The fa yeah, the whole concept of like the specialist noting something is wrong with this very esoteric thing mm. is just a very fascinating idea for a documentary. I think I'd enjoy that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'd pair it up with uh, 
the Amazing Randy documentary, An Honest Liar, where it's about the magician, the Amazing Randy, retired from being a magician to become a bus, like a, a buster of mysticism and you know skeptic stuff and all that. So he would come in and just be like, well, they see this televangelist is doing this, 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 is using all of these magician tricks to lie mm. because that's what they do. And I'm a big fan of uh, the Ocean's Eleven movies as well where you have uh, George Clooney needs a, you know this type of person to do this type of thing over here to get this done. And yeah, catch me if you can. Just a really, really great time. I, I still hold it up in a good spot with Steven Spielberg movies. It's, it's right up there for me. I mean, it doesn't have the sprawling ambition and emotional hit of, say, AI, but I, it's a better movie than AI to me. Like, it's far more cohesive. But in the end, I, I mean, I love Gigolo Joe and AI. Mm, yeah. But I love Christopher Walken here, so mm. it's, a, it's a real The music up. was more effective in this one. Oh, you think? <laughs> yeah. It wasn't too overbearing for you like it was an AI. Why is this so whimsical? This is a sad scene. <laughs> um, sh- should we noted, uh, Elizabeth Banks appeared in this movie. She was a bank teller. And I immediately saw her and said, Elizabeth Banks works in a bank. And I had a good chuckle. <laughs> and Amy Adams, obviously, is a pivotal role here. And I said to you that we've had her on the podcast before where she was in the Zach Braff film, The X, mm. where she played a neighbor who was like a, all about being a mother and like mommy stuff and all of that. Like a, she, I think she was pregnant yeah, in that. Yeah. And my main point was, and I brought this up on the podcast, is Amy Adams early in her career, now she's like a prestigious actress. Like she's one of the most Oscar nominated actresses of all time. She's like, she keeps getting nominated. But back in her career, and you see it definitely here, she would just play like weirdos. Like they were like, you're you're a little redhead, so you play play freaks. Like you play <laughs> n- crazy people or just kooky nut jobs. You are gonna have braces on you, and you're gonna play like this weird bizarro character and catch me if you can, or you're gonna play this weird bizarro. And I just I'm curious of when that changed because she even did the film um Enchanted, the Disney film where it's about a Disney princess comes into an actual world and she's a freak in that too like that's the joke that she's a disney princess trying to operate in new york and that sounds like a fun concept it's a great film and and (laughs) uh, and uh susan sarandon is the evil queen villain who also comes into the real world it's a great movie great film that does sound good let's check that out yeah uh uh, really worth the watch and uh patrick dempsey is just uh, the normal guy and uh James Marsden, who's uh, Cyclops from the X-Men movies, mm. he's the Prince Charming guy who comes into the real world too and he's like a dumb as, dumb as all hell. <laughs> but uh, she she at some point has turned around, but uh, just to touch on her briefly, do you have much of a connection with Amy Adams as an actress? She's also, like Leo, one of the most hardworking actors out there right now. Um, Yeah, I think it's just one of those things of like I've seen her in a couple of things and she always does a good job. Um. And then there's also, like, the recurring thing that I think gets brought up with us. It's, like, her and Isla Fisher, like, look similar. And mm-hmm. I get – I after you brought it up, I did get that a little bit. Like, you said, like, oh, she plays the, the freaky characters. I'm like, oh, yeah, she could have done Mary Jane and Scooby-Doo. <laughs> uh, did you ever watch Nocturnal Animals? By yes, any I saw that before you did. And do you remember the whole gag in that movie with Amy Adams? Oh, it's been, like, nine years since that film came out. Wasn't it that <sighs> there was a – Oh, Isla, Isla Fisher was in that film as well, right? So the whole thing is uh, Amy Adams is reading Jake Gyllenhaal's manuscript about their life, basically. And then the story we see inside that is that and only J- Jake Gyllenhaal is the actual guy in it. And then Amy Adams is played by Isla Fisher. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and Michael Shannon's in that too, as like a cop. Who, by the way, this actually ties in with Leo. There's a line in Nocturnal Animals, and I can't remember if I brought this up on the podcast before, but there's an ongoing Hollywood joke line that keeps being used, which is he is interrogating someone and they're saying, you're saying me? And it's like, yeah, yeah, I'm saying you. It's like, who, who? And it's like, no, why why are you hoo-hooing me? What are you, a fucking owl? Margot Robbie says that exact same fucking joke line to Leonardo DiCaprio and Wolf of Wall Street. Where it's like, Ooh, what am I, a fucking owl? It's a, there's this owl joke in Hollywood that they've used in like four or five movies in the last ten years. 
and I've noticed. Mm. I've noticed it. It keeps keeps hovering about. I don't know what's going on. Well, it's like the Wilhelm <laughs> scream of the modern generation. I was going to say this sounds like it's going to be like the shared universe thing of like the the who joke. Verse. Yes, the uh, what's that called? Uh, the yeah. Tommy something. Well, that thing with like every franchise is like in this kid's head or something. Yeah, like that. Yeah, because there was. Uh, it was a show where it's revealed at the end of it. It's actually all figment of this one autistic character's dreams. And then it's like, oh, no, but that show had so many spinoffs. And oh, no, and it's like Tommy Westfall or something. I can't remember. But uh, I don't have too much else to say about Catch Me If You Can. Do you have anything? Um, One of our favorite actresses was in this, and I didn't realize until I was reading up about it afterwards. Yes. Jennifer Garner. Uh, uh, you didn't notice that was Jennifer Garner? But somehow it just... I mean, it looked exactly. I mean, this would have been around suddenly thirty time as well, roughly a year yeah, or two before. Thereabouts, yeah, uh, Just the actress that popped up a million times for us on unappreciated masterpieces, a little bit in pictures power. I'm gonna say, is she the female Paul Giamatti for us? Where it's like this elusive figure that keeps turning up, but when they do, we just praise, like we just have a ball talking about them because Jennifer Garner is like. She's such a weird actor, huh? Mm. Like, she's, like, I don't know if I've ever seen her in anything. She's, like, not like Paul Giamatti in this way. But I've seen Paul Giamatti, I'm like, he's great. But in, with her, I don't think I've ever seen a movie with her specifically and they go, oh, Jennifer Garner. What a great performance from her. She's always reliable. Mm. But she is also given, talking about actors who, after a certain age, are given embarrassing roles. She has that, where she plays all of these mum roles and things. But also, it seems like she seeks those out. I don't know. But yes, she was here. She was the one that he uh, paid the night for. He got paid for the night for. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 yes. That was funny. I forgot she was in this. So when she turned up, I was like, oh, oh, there she is. (laughs) Oh, my God, she had to go. Oh, we really are doing this on the podcast. Now, uh, are we? would you recommend Catch Me If You Can? Yeah, definitely. This was a really fun film. It's on Netflix. So it was easy to find. Oh, it was on Netflix, was it? Yeah. Oh, good. I have it on DVD, so I didn't have to worry about it. Mm. This is one of those DVD ownerships. I'm like, I like this movie a lot. Mm. I'd own it on DVD. Uh, so that is a recommendation from me as well. Catch Me If You Can. Very, very, very I thought you meant for the next episode. <laughs> no, my recommendation is actually the next episode one. You got it. It's me next. Yep, and we're doing Ace Ventura, listening. Pet Detective. <laughs> Ace Ventura 2, When Nature Calls. Calls. The one I've seen the more, more of. <laughs> no, so um, we were having a discussion recently with my wife, Rachel, and she kind of bitched and moaned and complained and banged her foot on the ground and whimpered about how we haven't had her on since Juno. Um, I thought I was pod. the one that was complaining. <laughs> Shut up. No, no, she complained too. You okay. both complained. Uh, look, the thing is, I forget that we haven't had Rachel on in a while because I host a podcast with Rachel exactly. where we've had you on more recently on that podcast than she's been on this podcast. Mm. So uh, I think it's time to bring my wife back on and we're going to do a movie that I'm sure none of us have seen actually. All but three? Maybe. Let's see. Ooh. It's a film that's been on my watch list for a while, and I think it will appeal to my wife, Rachel. And it's one where, you know, if, you had see- if you've seen it, I would say you would have seen it with your mum. But it's called Enough Said, starring Julia Louis-Dreyfus and James Gandolfini. Mm-hmm. Enough Said. That's it. No, I don't not, know. I'm it's not telling so... you anything else. All I kind of know about it, I know a bit about it, but it's one, one of those movies where I was like, oh, that looks like a fun little movie. I'm going to add that to my list. And then it's just been sitting there for years and years and years. Mm-hmm. And I mean, the most I can tell you is it's got those two actors in it and it just looks like a sweet film. If you look up the poster, you go, oh, that looks like a sweet movie. So uh, let's see how uh, Enough Said holds up when we talk about it in detail next time on the pod. People, make sure to find a copy of that for yourself and give it a watch. In the meantime, uh, where can people find us on the internet, Bartek? You can find us on the internet, full stop, at Twitter. For look up Spit and Polish Presents, you can find us on Facebook, look up Spit and Polish Presents. Um, you can't find us, but you can reach us uh, at the email spitandpolished at gmail.com. Mm. Uh, we've also got a YouTube channel, uh, Spit and Polish Presents, uh, and it all goes on to Podbean and all the other podcatchers. Thank you for laying it all out there, Mr. Bartek. Well, you told me to do it, so I did it. 
sometimes you do snarky things instead of doing the things. It's because it's funny to me. And that's the end of the episode. And to no one else. And that's (laughs) the end of the episode. Bartek amusing himself greatly. Ryan in editing, I'm just acknowledging you. Fourth episode in a row. I don't have any suggestions. I don't know. Do the thing that I said three episodes ago. No. The more you say it, the more I'm not going to do it. And this time I'll add like some fart sound effect or something. <laughs> just to just to have amusement. I'll add a uh, Mr. Bones splat sound. Ryan in editing, do what Ryan in recording just said. Actually, no, Ryan in editing. Don't do that. <laughs> Ryan in editing hates you more than he hates me, Ryan, in recording. What is this, Leonardo DiCaprio's Inception? <laughs> I feel like we've really gone through a roller coaster ride. Oh yeah, he was Inception. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, buddy. 